and I'll just share my screen. And I'll just go back to where I want to be. And yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll down to where we want to start again now. Um, by the way, just to make out, just to mention that um, I will put the links to these videos in uh, the Canvas system directly so you can click on them. And then in your own time, you can watch these along with my own recording of the lecture itself to get a better picture for uh, the understanding of the concept of cathodic protection. So the topic now that we're going to finish off today with is the concept of inhibitors. So just to recap, we've looked at painting as a primary method of protecting metal, especially steel, and it's the most common method for preventing corrosion. And then we've looked at the application of electric field, either using a sacrificial anode to provide cathodic protection or by using a power supply to provide cathodic protection and also in some cases, anodic protection. So those are the methods we've just been looking at. The third quite commonly used method is something called an inhibitor. And an inhibitor is something you will put either into the water or the surrounding ground or the environment to be precise to stop the object from corroding or to slow down the corrosion rate. In other words, to inhibit the rate of corrosion. So that's what the word inhibit means, to slow down. And the question is, how do we do all of that? Well, first of all, let's have a look at some corrosion inhibitors. These are usually liquids that you pour into a container and they protect the object. And you might say, well, where would we use an inhibitor under what circumstances? Well, normally it would in, be in a system which is closed, what we call a closed loop system. A very good example would be the heating system in your house. If you happen to have a water heating system like I do, then you might want to stop your radiators from going rusty on the inside or something like that, by putting a corrosion inhibitor into the water that gets recirculated. Um, this is called a closed loop because a fixed volume of water, let's say is 20 litres, and it always remains 20 litres. And uh, as long as you don't replace that water, it'll remain in service for several years. And therefore you can put into your 20 litres some of this substance, it says, uh, JTM plumbing corrosion inhibitor. This is an English product and probably the same product I put in my house in England when I lived there. And it's probably still in 20 years later, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but the point is you put that into your closed loop system and it will protect the steel from going rusty. And the way it does that, essentially the molecules in the liquid, they absorb on the inside edge of the radiator in my case, or a pipe or whatever, and they stick to the surface and they slow down corrosion. So that's the basic idea of a corrosion inhibitor. These don't work if you're talking about protecting the, the hull of a ship for obvious reasons. You can't put the bottle of this in the ocean and expect it to do anything. It'll just dissolve away and there'll be nothing left of it. So you have to use some common sense as to when or when you do not use a corrosion inhibitor, and you generally use them in a closed loop system or a tank to prevent water, or and that doesn't necessarily have to be water, it could be a salt solution, it could be brine, it could be anything for that matter, it could be acid. And we put the liquid in to stop the corrosion of the container or the pipes that are connected to that container. So there are many different types of corrosion inhibitors you might need to know something about. So let's just go through some of those types. There are some called anodic inhibitors, and these in, um, inhibit the anodic process. There are others which are called cathodic inhibitors, and these inhibit the cathodic process. And there are some which are called organic inhibitors, which do both of those. And therefore they are given the name by the type of material they contain, which are organic compounds. <clears throat> 
So anobic in the, the first category is the anodic inhibitor. So what do they do? They react with the metal surface of the anode to form a protective film. So the idea here is you form a passive layer with the use of the inhibitor. So that's the anodic type. So examples would be using chromates, sorry, using chromates, nitrites, and nitrates. So the nitrite ion and the nitrate ion are very good at inhibiting the corrosion of steel, and they are of the anodic type. Chromates were very commonly used until about 20 years ago, but they are less commonly used because uh, of the risk of uh, hexachromium uh, compounds are highly toxic. You probably uh, have heard of several famous cases where people have been poisoned by uh, hexa hexachromic uh, compounds in the soil. So chromates are generally not used anymore. They've been replaced, but you, you should know about them all the same. Uh, nitrites and nitrates are still commonly used. So then there are other types which are, um, they require dissolved oxygen to work. So we have molybdates, silicates, phosphates, and borates. So these work, they protect the steel, let's say it's a steel object, by reacting with dissolved oxygen to form a protective film. This is particularly the case with phosphates. I've already mentioned phosphates in the primary layer of a paint. So now you might also understand that sometimes corrosion inhibitors are added to the paint itself. They are part of the paint formulation, especially if you have a phosphate or a borate or a silicate or a molybdate. These are often put in the primer paint. So therefore, you don't necessarily have to do this to use a corrosion inhibitor, although you often do in a closed loop system. You can also, in this particular case, put these compounds in the paint itself in the form of the primer. So the primer can contain corrosion inhibitors. So this just shows you some drawings I've done to really show how you can protect the metal for using a corrosion inhibitor. So here's the bare metal. And if you use the corrosion inhibitor, which forms a protective passive layer, then here's a passive film and it protects the metal from going rusty or corroding. If you have a defect in your layer, let's say you, it's a piece of stainless steel, which has a natural passive film, but let's say you have a defect and you break down the passive film, then you can seal that defect with the inhibitor, which plugs the hole, if you like. It gets absorbed into the crack or the, the pit, in the case of stainless steel, and it prevents any further corrosion from happening. You have to be aware of one thing, though, that if the inhibitor concentration is not high enough, it doesn't work properly. So when you're putting in your bottle of uh, corrosion inhibitor in your tank, you need to make sure you put the right amount in. If you only put a little bit in, it's not going to work properly and it could be next to useless. It might actually aggravate corrosion rather than preventing it. So it's very important you put the right amount in. In other words, the concentration is high enough to make it work properly. So what about uh, cathodic inhibitors? Well, they react to reduce the cathodic reaction normally by reacting with dissolved oxygen. And I just gave you an example of that a minute ago. So dissolved oxygen is the main thing we want to try to reduce when we're talking about a steel object because steel, the plain carbon steel goes rusty, but it'll only go rusty so long as there is dissolved oxygen. And if you remove all of the dissolved oxygen, then the rusting process actually stops completely. So if you can put in a chemical, which we call a cathodic inhibitor, and it reacts with that dissolved oxygen, then the corrosion process will stop and therefore it's protected. So some examples of cathodic inhibitors will be hydroxides of zinc and magnesium, uh, calcium carbonate or chalk is quite often used, and sodium hydrogen phosphate or sodium biphosphate. So these are quite commonly used as cathodic inhibitors. And the phosphate is often used, as I just said a minute ago, in primer paint. If the paint can, contains a phosphate, then it's of this type of inhibitor. 
Sometimes um, also you have to bear in mind that the liquid that is aggressive is not necessarily neutral pH. It could be an acid or it could be an alkali for that matter. And sometimes we have to prevent hydrogen evolution. So if you have a steel and is going to be exposed to acid, if you don't protect it somehow, you will get hydrogen evolution and this will cause the steel to dissolve. So one common way of doing that is to use salts of bismuth and antimony. Bismuth and antimony are elements and they are used to make corrosion inhibitors specifically for the case where you have an acid system and you want to stop your tank, which is containing acid from corroding. You would put this into the tank as a corrosion inhibitor. Um, just a point about safety. Uh, cathodic inhibitors are safe, meaning that they generally work quite well, even if the concentration is below the recommended level. They still generally do work. So that's why we often use cathodic inhibitors, because they're safe to use. Whereas the other types of inhibitors, the organic ones and the acid ones, they don't work if the concentration is not high enough. So you need to read the instructions carefully when you're using them. Now let's talk about organic inhibitors. These are quite commonly used because they don't contain any metals for a start. And often that means we don't contaminate the surroundings. And we use, if you use the right kind of organic material, then they are not necessarily harmful to the environment. Organic inhibitors tend to be long chain organic molecules which are absorbed on the metal surface. And therefore, because they stick to the surface, they prevent the aggressive components such as chloride ions from getting close enough to the surface to cause damage. So they provide a barrier to oxygen and they trap metal ions. So the organic molecules simply coat the surface in a rather clever way that prevents corrosion from happening. You've already come across one of them, agar gel, Believe it or not, there are some kinds of agar which prevent corrosion. Not the one I showed you, I used one which did not do that, but there are other types of agar, and maybe show you another day, that are used to prevent corrosion. And since agar is a naturally occurring substance, it's a vegetarian, if you like, it doesn't cause any damage whatsoever to the environment. It's completely safe and harmless. So agar is quite a good one to choose. That's this one here. Another one you could use is sodium benzoate. This is the sodium salt of benzoic acid, which is a benzoate. I'm not going to go into chemicals yet. I'll do that in a minute. Another one is the thanalamine or ethanolalanine. So this is an amine, which is used to protect. So amines, this word amine here, uh, I'm sorry. The amine is a type of nitrogen compound which is, has a high pH and therefore is slightly alkaline and it protects very well. The great thing about organic inhibitors, unlike the other types, you don't need very much of them to work. Typically 0.05% is all you need. In other words, not very much. One or two drops in the bucket full will be enough, let's say. So corrosion inhibitors is big business actually, just one reason why I should know about it, because if you get jobs in industry and need to know about this, you might become a corrosion engineer. You might be involved in making these or work for a company that does make them. And it's big business. You can see here, it's a multi-million dollar business. In fact, the business of corrosion inhibitors, making them, supplying them and using them. And as you can see, most of them, the blue ones are in fact of the organic type and not so many of them are of the inorganic. And that's for fairly obvious reasons. As I just said, you don't need very much of it to do the job. Um, because they're organic, they tend to be quite environmentally friendly. Whereas the metallic based ones are not. You have to be careful when you use the metallic ones and make sure you either use them in the primer paint or you use them in the closed loop system. So, then let's look at some of the other types again in more, more closely. So let's look at inorganic corrosion inhibitors. These are ones which contain metal ions in effect or they're metal, metallic compounds. So we've got molybdenum, we've got phosphate, we've got phosphate zinc and we've got tin. 
And these are carbon steel coupons which have been coated with the corrosion inhibitors and then exposed to a corrosion environment. And this shows you the dosage in parts per million of how much you've actually used. If it's in parts per million, that means it's not a very large amount. It's quite a small amount in reality. So here's the control sample with no corrosion inhibitor. And here we put in molybdenum of 15 parts per million, and it doesn't seem to have done very much. You could almost argue it's done nothing at all. If you then put in phosphate, I'm not sure what TKPP is. That sounds like a product name. I'm not quite sure what that is. But the phosphate is the important thing here in the range of three to one parts per million. Then you can start to see some effect. If you then put in another type of phosphate formulation, this contains zinc, then you can see a huge difference here. There's very little corrosion compared to these other samples. And if you use tin, it's a tin-based corrosion inhibitor, then the only corrosion I can see is that little spot there. There's almost no corrosion on the rest of the surface. So that should give you a rough idea of how you can reduce the amount of corrosion by applying a corrosion inhibitor. But this particular type is an inorganic version. I've already mentioned phosphating in the primer paints, but let's go back to that story again, because it's important to look at the phosphate in terms of a corrosion inhibitor, even though it's in the primer paint itself. So normally with steel, the first thing we actually do is put a primer onto it, as I already mentioned, before we put any more paint on. And what we're actually doing here, we're creating, if you look at the reactions here, the phosphate that's in the paint, it reacts with Fe2+, which is the corrosion product from, the first corrosion product from steel is to form Fe2+, as you know. It reacts with a phosphate that's in the paint to form um, iron phosphate. So that's the reaction with Fe2 plus ions. But then, as you know, when steel goes to the next oxidation state, it forms ferric ions, normally in the form of rust. But before it forms rust, it reacts with the phosphate ions again. And this time it forms this phosphate ion. So this phosphorus compound here forms, in effect, a passive film on the surface of the steel because it's a part of the paint itself. It can't go anywhere. It stays there. So by forming these phosphate compounds on the surface of the steel, we are preventing the rest of the steel from going rusty. So we stop the corrosion because we have a, a fast initial reaction with the primer paint. When we first apply it, it starts reacting immediately to form these protective passive films of phosphate, iron phosphate to be precise. So this is iron two phosphate and this is iron three phosphate. Um, phosphate uh, can also be bought in large quantities as well, so you can apply it directly. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the form of a primer. You can mix it up and add it to your um, corrosion environment as a phosphate in solution. So this goes to show the problem again. You've seen this before, but I'll show you once again. Here's our paint layer, and the paint layer has got a crack in it and we're starting to form an anodic site, a pit. And down here, we have the cathodic site. It's another gap in the paint. And here's the rust, which usually forms a little bit further away from the, the pit, as we've seen before. But if we put the corrosion inhibitors in, then the cor corrosion inhibitors then can fill the pit with the inhibitor material itself, and therefore prevent any further attack. So these are the classifications, the family tree of inhibitors. So I've just said we inhibitors are of inorganic or they are organic. And if in both cases, they can either be of the anodic type, the cathodic type, or another type which I haven't specifically mentioned, although I've implied it, the absorption type. And here's some examples as well. So we have some anodic coaters, they're sometimes called correct coaters. And here we have some cathodic inhibitors. We often use the word inhibitor, but sometimes we have coater as well. A sequestering agent is something which captures 
probably the oxygen in this case. And here we have the anodic region and the cathodic region. And these are the examples of the inhibitors we're using. So here we got sodium silicate, and here we have zinc orthophosphate. These are anodic types. The cathodic type, we have calcium carbonate, polyphosphates, and zinc orthophosphate. Sometimes we might want to protect the inside of a copper pipe. So let's say we have a heat exchanger and we have a fluid in there. What we want to try to avoid is this situation where we're getting an attack inside the inner wall of our copper pipe. Because if we have this, we can't see it going on, it's invisible. So in order to be sure this doesn't happen, we want to put in the corrosion inhibitor inside the pipe. It's part of the closed loop system, so it goes in the header tank, first of all. And in this particular case, we're putting in either phosphate, which is the anodic type, or we're putting zinc in, in the form of zinc 2 plus ions, which is clearly going to be cathodic, give cathodic protection, as we already know. And these would then react to fill up the holes where the anodes are occurring. So we protect the metal. So the cathodic uh, inhibitor, the zinc, will go on the cathodic region. And if we put in phosphate, that will go straight to where the anodes are formed. And the two together will protect the metal. In this case, it's copper. So here's our other corrosion inhibitor again, as I told you before, but just to reiterate the point, the, the inhibitors are normally a liquid. They're normally a solution of the actual active ingredient in a liquid could be water, it could be oil, it could be a solvent even for that matter. Normally it's in water. So we mentioned that word absorption a minute ago, so let's just go back to that idea. So the idea here is that um, if we use an organic type of inhibitor, normally you have what is called a hydrocarbon chain, which is this wiggly line here, and on the end we have a polar head group. And the, the polar head group normally has the uh, a, a, a charge on it. And the way it works is that these align themselves with the header groups sticking to the steel pipe wall. And I'm, I'm assuming that we have brine, which is uh, salt water, and it will contain carbon dioxide, oxygen, maybe hydrogen sulfide as well. And these molecules are physically absorbed onto the surface of the pipe and they protect the object from, let's say, the steel pipe from going rusty. Now let's turn our attention to concrete. We've already looked at concrete from a corrosion point of view, but now let's look at it from a protection point of view of how we might protect concrete by using an inhibitor to stop it. So we already know what the problem is because I explained that to you in a previous lecture. The problem is that if we don't do something about it, the rebars in the concrete will eventually start to go rusty and they will expand and create stress in the concrete, causing it to crack and eventually falling away, leaving exposed rebars. This is what we're trying to avoid. Over here, you've got uh, some rebars. The two on the left are just ordinary ones which have gone rusty. You can see the rust on them but the in-between ones have been coated with a corrosion inhibitor and they haven't gone rusty at all. So therefore, if we could find a way of coating our rebars with the corrosion inhibitor, we might be able to stop this happening altogether. And that's the idea. How do we do that? Well, there's various ways we can do that. First of all, we need to know something about the types of inhibitors we might use. So I'm going to do some bit of chemistry now, so show you some. So I already mentioned that amines are very good corrosion inhibitor. And here's the formula for an amine, N2H4. And in this particular case, it's hydrazine. A hydrazine reacts with oxygen to form nitrogen and water. So this is an example where we're using the corrosion inhibitor to react with the oxygen, which would otherwise have caused corrosion. Let's say it would have caused the formation of rust. By reacting with something which is an amine, we've the oxygen has been converted into water, which is clearly quite safe, very benign, and nitrogen, which will form as a gas. 
So hydro, we don't normally use hydrazine itself because that's quite toxic and quite difficult to work with, but we can have this compound embodied into an organic molecule, which we call an amine. And here we have benzotriazole. So here's the benzene ring, which I'm sure you all know about if you've studied chemistry. And here's the amine group here, this NH group here. And this is the azole group here, this nitrogen double bond here. So give it a little bit of flavor of the chemistry. When I studied chemistry, we had to make these, but I'm not going to explain how to do that to you. So, but this is a, the sort of big picture of a whole load of compounds which do exactly what I've just said. I'm not going to go into all the chemistry of this because I think we will um, run out of time if I try to, but here we have imidazole, here we have uh, four methyl imidazole. Methyl group is just up here, just off the top of the screen, unfortunately. I'm not sure if I can, oops, get rid of that. Look. There we go. So here's the methyl group on the imidazole group. Here we have a um, carboxyl group here. And here we have um, an, uh, a, um, carboxylate group here and I'll move that back up there out of the way and so on and so on. So these are all good corrosion inhibitors. They're all based on amines and they all have this cyclic ring to them. And uh, here we have the absorption of the, in this case, an amine onto the surface of our steel pipe and with the polar groups attaching to the metal. And here we show it again here. So this, if I was to draw you a picture of, uh, of a corrosion inhibitor in operation, this is the picture you might choose to draw because what it's showing here, this is a particularly good one. Let me just move that out of the way. So what we've got here is um, the corrosion, the rust inhibitor is absorbing on the metal surface and it's so strongly absorbed, it's pushing the water molecules away from the surface. So in this case, we can't get any corrosion because the water is not in contact with the surface of the metal anymore. The surface of the metal is actually dry, believe it or not, because the molecules are pushing away the water. So the water is being repelled. So in the lower diagram, I'll just move that up there out of the way again. We just got the molecules absorbed on the surface. And this might be, it's not very thick, it's just one molecule long. So it may be just a few nanometers in thickness. In other words, very thin layer. We don't need very much of the inhibitor to work. And the inhibitor coats the surface and prevents corrosion. So going back to the concrete again, one of the ways which has turned out to be very popular for protecting concrete, and in particular the rebars in the concrete, is to use a volatile corrosion inhibitor, otherwise known as a VCI, a volatile corrosion inhibitor. What does that mean? Well, we take an organic compound like one of these, for example, which has a finite vapor pressure. So these are chosen on purpose to be volatile, meaning that um, if you leave them on the table, they eventually evaporate. And the idea is we do that. We, we create a situation where we can evaporate, in other words, put into the vapor phase, the corrosion inhibitor. So what's that got to do with concrete? Well, the idea is that the, the VCI can diffuse into the surface of the concrete because the, the concrete is porous and it has lots of uh, air trapped in it actually. And if that air gets replaced by the volatile corrosion inhibitor, it can penetrate quite a long way into the surface and therefore reach the metal rebars and coat them with the active ingredient. So here's an example for it. So here's a block of concrete and these are the rebars. And we're now using a, a vapor type of uh, corrosion inhibitor. And this is made by a company called Vapro. This is the company, this is off the company website. I should have given you a link, but I didn't, but you can find it yourself. But uh, so Vapro uh, CRI, this is a corrosion inhibitor, which is based on the volatile method that I'm explaining to you. Um, the material diffuses in the form of a vapor into the concrete 
and it forms a protective layer directly on the rebar itself. So because it's um, volatile, it can penetrate quite a long way into the concrete and far enough to reach the rebars, especially the ones close to the surface, as shown by the green region. This process diffusion is going on. And here it shows you again. So we have, um, first, the first thing we have is capillary absorption. So you have to remember the concrete is porous. The corrosion inhibitor goes through the pores by a process of diffusion. And when it reaches the metal, it absorbs physically onto the surface of the metal, forming a monomolecular layer on the surface of the metal. And it suppresses the anodic and the cathodic reactions. It suppresses both of them. So this is a very powerful way of protecting uh, steel in a concrete structure. So we, the, the key thing is the diffusion. The diffusion allows the corrosion inhibitor to reach the rebars. And once it's done that, it forms by physical absorption, this monolayer of molecules on the surface, just like we have shown here, there's our monolayer. And this shows it in more detail, in fact, that uh, Here's the vapor diffusion that I've been talking about all the time. And we have uh, also some capillary action as well. You might say, what's the difference between capillary action and the vapor diffusion? Um, it depends on whether or not there's any water trapped in the, uh, the structure and whether or not the, the pores are microporous or macroporous. So I'm not really going to go to that level of detail here, but you just need to know that capillary action can occur and also we need to have a vapor diffusion, otherwise we won't get anything on the surface. And you can see these uh, charges here, we have um, plus and minus charges. So here's the vapor phase I've been talking about, which is occurring inside the concrete itself. And it allows by diffusion process, the entire rebar to be coated with the inhibitor, shown green in this case. And it's coated by what's called ionic uh, attraction, because the in this particular case, the corrosion inhibitor has charges on it, uh, plus and minus. So this shows it again. Here's the unprotected steel. And this is what happens if you don't do anything about it. We have chloride ion present because it's probably exposed to seawater, which contains three and a half percent sodium chloride if you remember. And if we don't put the corrosion inhibitor in, we're going to get this situation. But if we do put the corrosion inhibitor in, we're going to get a nice clean surface. So that's it. That's the end of the lecture for today. So we've covered a lot of ground, I know, but I'm, if I, I'm going to stop the video now and I'm going to save it. So if you just wait about, um, let me look at my clock. I'll come back to you uh, at 3.30 very briefly, and then we'll finish for the day. But I just want to make sure I've uploaded all the videos before I send them. Close down, and I'll come back to you in, uh, it's 14.40. I'll come back to you at, can I come back to you at three o'clock if that's okay? That's in 20 minutes from now. Give me time to upload all of the videos and also to set you an exercise for today. I'll come back to you at three o'clock.